Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Last year, we looked at the first ever comic outing of Star Wars. And technically the first outing of Star Wars altogether, with the comic adaptation of A New Hope. As commented before, Star Wars became an ongoing after that, much the same way Star Trek comics tended to follow on from a movie adaptation back in the day. And thus, when it came time to do an adaptation of The Empire Strikes Back, they just folded it into the regular book. Thus, issues 39 to 44 were devoted to the adaptation. Like with A New Hope, a re-release of the comic completely altered its coloring and shading to better match the look of the movie, and arguably it looks ugly because this is artwork that was not intended for digital coloring techniques. However, I do feel I feel that Empire fared a lot better in the recoloring than A New Hope did, probably owing itself to experience and just the color palette being darker with better contrasting sections. Space scenes are still really overdone, but the scenes featuring people, not so much. For the three of you watching this who have never seen Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back is considered almost universally to be the best Star Wars movie of all, which is kind of hilarious considering when it came out, people hated it. The Empire Strikes Back is slower than A New Hope, a bit more contemplative, more philosophical, and not only is the plot overall darker, with our heroes constantly on the run or in the clutches of the villains, but it's also just a grimier movie, full of swamps and caves and industrial sections. It's more lived in and thus dirtier. It is not a happy movie, but it does codify a lot of stuff about the universe, about the Jedi, and of course the twist nobody saw coming at the time of release that simultaneously helped ensure the legacy of this franchise as well as dooming it because suddenly being related to somebody became an important aspect of the universe. And no, Rise of Skywalker, I will not forgive you for that bullcrap! But enough about that. We're here to talk about Episode 5, a.k.a. the second one. Let's dig into the comic adaptation of The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> title? It's not actually Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, it's just The Empire Strikes Back. I know George Lucas's reasoning was that putting a 2 at the end, like Star Wars 2, would have made people disappointed since sequels were usually considered inferior to the original back then, but still, weird, isn't it? We've got six issues to look at, and the covers aren't really much to talk about save for one, so we'll skip them for the most part. I know that may be shocking to hear, since this Marvel comic could be worth $2,500 for me. I checked eBay. You might want to scratch off a couple of zeros from that, and you'll be closer. We open with a splash page that's pretty much just a cover in itself, though I love how even though the opening crawl is on the next page, because of the way comics were presented in 1980, there's still a blurb at the top giving a quick synopsis of the premise of Star Wars. Long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there exists a state of cosmic civil war. And yet, the space Super Bowl goes on. A brave alliance of underground freedom fighters has challenged the tyranny and oppression of the awesome Galactic Empire. This is their story. Unfortunately, their story is being deleted without ever being released for the sake of a tax write-off. We truly open with the GAH! MY EYES! Ah, who knew you could get snow blind from a comic book? Who decided you should have white text on blue? Yeah, the redone coloring fixes this, so we'll use 
that instead for this bit. God, this is the opening crawl text. I know this wouldn't be as bad when it was originally released since the newsprint would darken it, but still. Anyway, the opening crawl is different from the final one used in the movie, and it was definitely good to change it, namely because, like the original crawl from A New Hope, a lot of the information isn't really that relevant. After the destruction of its most feared battle station, the Empire has declared martial law throughout the galaxy. The New York Times opinion page declares it a logical, fair-minded move against the terrorists that destroyed a job creator. A thousand worlds have felt the oppressive hand of the Emperor as he attempts to crush the growing rebellion. The Emperor says it's just a cosmic stress ball. As the Imperial grip of tyranny tightens, Princess Leia and the small band of freedom fighters search for a more secure base of operations. Luke, meanwhile, tries to figure out where the hell he parked. And indeed, we're opening on the Ice World Hoth, where Luke is scouting around on his very purple Tauntaun. Something that looks like a meteorite crashes nearby, and he calls it in, saying he's gonna go check it out. The Tauntaun suddenly gets very nervous, and Luke soon finds out why as a space yeti attacks him and knocks him unconscious. This sequence was written to explain real-life injuries Mark Hamill had gotten before filming, and consequently were heavily covered up with makeup in the Star Wars Holiday Special. Come on, Mala, let's see a little smile. <laughs> That's better. At the meteorite crash site, we discover it was actually an Imperial probe droid that rises up and begins searching around. You know, it is kind of weird that with how big a planet is that the droid managed to land like 10 minutes away from the Rebel base. If this is the will of the Force or something, the Force is an asshole. The Rebels have constructed a stronghold underground as Han Solo returns and checks in with Chewbacca, who's doing repairs on the Millennium Falcon. Hey Chewie! How's it coming with the Falcon's lifters? Sooner they're fixed, the sooner we're out of here! <laughs> alright, alright, I'll go report and give you a hand! Take a look at that face on Chewbacca. That is the face that says, Oh God, just bring me some coffee and let me work in peace, don't try to help. Unlike the movie, the next dialogue exchange happens in the hangar bay as opposed to the control center, with Han informing a guy that he needs to be leaving soon. If I don't pay off Jabba the Hutt, I'm a walking dead man. And I got out of that series after season three. Also, Hutt spelled with only one T. Neat. Apparently in between movies, a bounty hunter had gone after him, and that's what encouraged him to go leave now. Although why he couldn't pay off the debt and then come back again earlier eludes me. Or that he couldn't just do that now. I mean, obviously the long wait would piss off Jabba. I'm just saying in theory here. But yeah, he says his goodbye to Leia, but when she doesn't make a big deal out of it, he gets pissed. But you're a natural leader. We still need you. Han Solo, natural leader. <laughs> no, your worship. That's not why you came after me. I think you were afraid I was leaving you without even a kiss. What? I'd just as soon kiss a Wookiee. I could see that too. She seemed super into Life Day during the holiday special. Well, either that or the cocaine. Believe me, you could use a good kiss. You've been so busy giving orders, you've forgotten how to be a woman. And you've been so busy being a douchebag, you've forgotten how to not be sexist. This was all condensed down in the actual movie, and probably for the best, not just because of the women should be kissing bullcrap, but because it's just kind of the same point repeated. Help the rebellion. No, you just want to bang me. Anyway, while that bit was cut out, another bit that was removed starts clawing its way through a wall of ice without them noticing it. Luke awakens hanging upside down from the ceiling of a cave. How did that thing do that? It looks like the snow and ice formed around his legs. His lightsaber is on the ground under him, and he tries reaching for it, but it's out of range. This is where the movies properly introduce that the Force also gives you telekinesis. In the comics, we knew that already, because Darth Vader really likes coffee at the morning meetings. And in the movie, Luke just instinctively knows he can do that. Here, though, he hears a quiet voice instruct him. Luke, you must relax. Think the saber into your hand. Let the force flow, Luke. Flow like the blood rushing to your head that's making you hallucinate my voice, Luke. There's a thought. Is there one of those goofy, it was all a dream theories that the rest of the franchise from this point on is just an hallucination in Luke's mind from the blood going to his head right before he's eaten? Since again, when this came out, the movie's established only here that the force can let you lift objects with your mind. Maybe his mind just made that up. I mean, imagine what could have happened if Luke had died on Hoth. Okay, so we don't have to. I'll probably cover that one at some point. 
Lucas freed, and the creature that grabbed him, called a Wampa, attacks. In the special edition, they added more scenes of the Wampa, originally just an arm or so, because the original costume proved difficult to work with and at times looked comically bad. And it seems the comic decided to follow that strategy, as we only see parts of it here like its arm. Still, Luke manages to slash at it with his lightsaber and escape out into the cold. Back at the Rebel base, 3PO and R2 find Han and tell him that Luke never returned and it's about to become night outside, where the temperature will drop even more. Han learns from the watch officer that something attacked a Tauntaun and their speeders aren't going to be ready until at least morning, so he decides to take one out for himself to try to rescue Luke. So the temperature is falling rapidly. The nightly storms will start before any of you reach the first marker. Then I'll see you in hell. You and your stupid thoughtfulness can go to hell. Luke, meanwhile, continues to wander through the snowstorm, but finally sees something in the distance. Obi-Wan Kenobi. This way. Look at me. You must survive. I need to borrow some money, Luke. Turns out you still pay rent when you're part of the Force. B ben? I'm so cold, Ben. So cold. Your own fault for deciding to visit Minnesota, Luke. Especially Fawn Circle. You must go to the Dagobah system. You will learn from Yoda, the Jedi Master. The one who taught me. Wait, I thought... Qui-Gon was your master. That bastard's dead to me ever since he stole my credit card to feed his gambling habit. You must, Luke. You're our only hope. The expanded universe hasn't introduced the thousands of Jedi who are still running around. Until then, you're our only hope. Luke passes out, Han thankfully managing to locate him a few seconds later. Unfortunately, the Tauntaun dies from the cold immediately after. Is it weird that a Tauntaun, a species that is native to Hoth, keels over before Han does? I mean, I get that it's exhausted from moving through the storm, but it seems like it should be more resilient than these two to this sort of thing. Unlike in the movie, we don't see Han cutting the Tauntaun open to keep Luke warm while he sets up a shelter. While the rest of our heroes are worried about them back at the base, fortunately in the morning, they're soon rescued by a speeder. Echo Base, this is Rogue Two. I found them. Repeat, I found them. Man, Rogue Two has a happier ending than Rogue One did. Back at the base, Luke is put into a healing tube. Yeah, yeah, back to tank, but I see these things in science fiction all the time, so to me, they're just healing tubes full of healing juices. Space age technology is just pickling things. Leia is grateful to Han for finding him, but he says they have to be more concerned with whatever attacked him. And indeed, there's a Wampa storming through the base and the troops fight it. And that's the end of it! One panel, then in the command center they report that it's over and they can detect them now. In the movie, this was a cut subplot of a few scenes, including trapping one inside of a room and putting a warning label on the door. That 3PO ripped off when the Empire attacked so that snowtroopers could meet the Wampas when they went exploring. It's good that they cut it because it doesn't contribute anything to the story, but it does suck to lose a fun moment of 3PO of all people managing to deliver some indirect damage to the villains. Anyway, with that non-plot out of the way, a recon station detects the probe droid and just blows up. I mean, I guess that it's supposed to be the probe droid shot them, but there isn't a line or anything indicating that. Don't move a muscle or we'll shoot you with our invisible guns. Han and Chewbacca head out next to check it out, Han managing to get a shot off on it. And kablammo! I didn't hit it that hard, but they had some kind of self-destruct. All I did was hit it in that bag of dynamite it was carrying. We cut over to Deep Space, where a Super Star Destroyer gets a report from the destroyed probe. Unfortunately, I think the letterer accidentally gave the word balloons to the wrong people here, as Captain Piat reports this to Admiral Ozzel. Sure, they're far away, but in the next panel we see Ozzel and he looks more like Piat. Anyway, Ozzel disregards the report, saying that it could be anything, and that a minor lead isn't anything to go by. Darth Vader, however, is aboard and says that the Hoth system is definitely where they are, leading us into issue 40. With the likelihood of the Empire soon coming to Hoth, the Rebels start preparing for an attack and evacuation. I spoke a little too soon earlier, as we do have the bit of the Wampa trapped in a closet or whatever, though only for 3PO to comment on it. It has no bearing on anything else. Also, Wampa is another example of a Star Wars name somehow entering the popular lexicon, even though it is never spoken on screen. Weird, isn't it? Luke is having his face mask removed before they put on the makeup, or rather it's healing his injuries as Leia comes to check on him. You know, Leia, when I was lost out there in that snow and ice and it looked pretty bad, well, I felt... I felt afraid for you. Leia, I don't really know how to say this, but you must know that you... well, you're the only one I... I... Somewhere, Obi-Wan is out there screaming, Oh God, why didn't I warn them about this? No! 
Before the two can kiss, thankfully 3PO and R2 enter and interrupt. However, even if the two weren't actually siblings, Luke would throw some cold water on the whole thing with this line. Leia, wait. W what would you think if I went away for a while to another system, a place called Dagobah? What? That's just fine. First Han, now you! Wait, you don't understand! I want to take you to Dagobah Disneyland, but I need to scope it out first! Han and Chewbacca come in, and yeah, this is actually the last scene in the movie where all of our principal leads are together. Which I know was also a bit contentious for people when the movie came out. I think the story is told well enough that it doesn't make a difference, but anyway, Han has been informed that he can't leave now until they're certain about the Imperial probe droid. But Han just assumes that Leia is using that as an excuse to keep him there. Especially after expressing your true feelings when we were alone the other day. That she'd rather kiss a Wookiee? Leia decides to settle this by grabbing Luke and making out with him right there. I'd just like to remind you all that R2-D2 was present at their births and knows damn well who they are now and is now watching this happen and probably trying his damnedest to contain all his beeps and boops of laughter about this. I guess neither of you understand everything about women, do you? I don't. I figure you would have kissed 3PO to try to make that point. It says something that a lot of this dialogue was changed for the finished movie. Less friendly banter and barbs like fuzzball or scruffy looking nerf herder. Hell, even the art seems to reflect this as everyone seems more meh or angry instead of any smiles. The closest you get is when Han enters and that expression less says, I'm happy you're alive and more, my boat. The order of events was also changed here. In the movie, the scene with the probe droid being destroyed was after Luke's recovery. Outside the system, Vader and his fleet arrive. Although instead of being in his private chamber when he learns this, he's out in a corridor. There's an energy shield protecting the planet that will resist any laser bombardment from orbit, meaning a ground assault is their only option. To Vader's annoyance. Ozzel came out of light speed too close to the system. We're coming on too strong. This relationship won't get off the ground now. He felt that surprise was a wiser. He is as clumsy as he is stupid. The man keeps tripping over me and spilling my coffee. On the bridge, Ozzel's about to update Vader when Vader force chokes him to death without even raising his hand. This is definitely all a shift from how Vader was portrayed in A New Hope. More a high-ranking servant of Tarkin rather than the man in charge as he is here, casually killing his officers who fail him. You know, Anakin's problem was that he cared too much about people. Oh, I'm an asshole. Anyway, yeah, this art is once again mixing up Ozzel and Piet. Piet's the thin, tall guy, while Ozzel is the guy with the mustache. So, Vader killed the wrong guy here. Although that could just be a sign that Vader doesn't really pay attention to any of these people. He just waits for them to stop talking. He's actually killed five different guys that he just keeps calling Admiral Ozzel. Leia briefs the troops on the evacuation plan. Fighters providing escort for the larger transports to leave when they temporarily drop the shield, with ground-based ion cannons providing covering fire. Meanwhile, Han and Chewie continue to try to repair the Falcon. That should do it, Chewie! Let's give the lifters a try! And it explodes. All right, all right, so that doesn't do it! Damn Apple anti-repair practices! As the plan begins and they knock out a Star Destroyer, Luke prepares to head into a speeder to help fight against the ground invasion. He and Han say their farewells, mostly knowing looks in the movie, but this is still good. Han, I hope you make your peace with Jabba, even if it does throw half the galaxy's bounty hunters out of work. Han Solo, industry disruptor. The speeders, like a TIE fighter, are designed to have two pilots, a gunner and a driver. So Luke joins his gunner, Dak, inside one. Glad to see you back and well, sir. Now I feel like we can take on the whole empire. Yeah. Yeah? I know what you mean. I have a ghost whispering in my brain to tell me when to shoot things. We're gonna be fine. And thus begins the attack of the Imperial Walkers, or AT-ATs. Huge, imposing, somewhat impractical design, but they're scary as hell, which is kind of the point. To quote Stargate SG-1, it's a weapon of terror, meant to intimidate the enemy, rather than a weapon of war designed to kill the enemy. Mind you, the Rebels aren't exactly armed with floating tanks and capital warships, so the impracticality of a slow, lumbering camel that can only shoot what's in front of it is kind of mitigated. Imperial Walkers advancing on your position! Advancing. And firing! Wait a second, they're firing directly into the air! They're switching sides! The walkers are heavily armored though, so the speeder's weapons do nothing. It's made no better by Dak getting killed when a shot hits him and Luke. While Leia announces an acceleration of the evacuation, despite the increased risk of sending more than one transport at a time, Luke comes up with a new strategy for the remaining speeders. Use their tow cables and harpoons to wrap around the legs of the walkers and entangle them so they trip and fall over. And while in the movie, suddenly 
certainly this makes them much more susceptible to laser fire somehow. Here, they really shouldn't have stored all those oily rags and gunpowder because it just freaking blows up upon collapsing. This is why your evil empire really shouldn't buy from the lowest bidder people. Just imagine this thing tripping on a pothole and just spontaneously combusting. Luke Speeder gets shot down, though he's able to escape it. Weirdly, this is where the issue ends instead of holding the suspense of the walker crushing it. After our standard issue recap page that actually shows events from later, Luke works out a plan to deal with the AT-AT about to shoot their power generator. Okay, I can use the force to move things with my mind, so I'll throw my lightsaber up and slice through everything! Yeah. Okay, plan B. He uses a magnetic grapple gun to climb up to the underside of the walker, uses his lightsaber to slice open a hole, then chucks a grenade inside before dropping down again. Still, it's only delaying the inevitable as Han goes to retrieve Leia. Get her to evacuate too. She gives the final evacuation order for all remaining troops and heads out, but the way to her escape transport is blocked off by falling debris, so their only shot is the Falcon. As they make their way inside, enemy troops begin pouring in. Somewhere behind them, the last defenses fall before advancing stormtroopers. So is there an EU explanation why this says stormtroopers and not snow troopers? Because I know with Star Wars, we're not allowed to have mistakes or shorthand for general terminology. Now joined personally by their supreme commander. God, I love snow. Total opposite of sand. When we're all done here, let's make a snowman. The Falcon's repairs are incomplete, and they just barely manage to escape from the hangar bay while being shot at by the snowtroopers. While 3PO ended up with the Falcon crew, R2 sticks with Luke to be the support droid for his X-Wing as he makes his own escape from Hoth. But as the Falcon becomes a twinkle in Hoth's cold blue sky, Luke wonders when he'll see his friends again, for his rendezvous will not be the one determined by the Rebel Alliance. Instead, an awkward meeting at a public bathroom. Unlike the movie, we actually learned that several of the Rebel ships were destroyed in the evacuation, as reported to Darth Vader. But the fleet's tracking scanners are on the Millennium Falcon. I want that ship. But sir, why are you so obsessed with that ship in particular? Because I want Skywalker, obviously. They reach orbit, but are blocked by two Star Destroyers. Fortunately, Han's a hell of a pilot and manages to outmaneuver them to the point where they collide with each other. However, they can't pull the same trick against fighters, so they try to jump to light speed and fail. The hyperdrive is damaged. While they're chased off, Luke heads in a different direction in his X-Wing. That's right, little guy. I'm not regrouping with the others. Strange as it seems, we're going to a place Ben Kenobi told me about. A place called Dagobah. It's the Benihana of space! Yes, I heard about it from him when I was wounded and wandering in that blizzard back on Hoth, but trust me, R2, this isn't a relapse. R2-D2 is now just realizing that he is stuck in a spaceship with this guy. Dagobah is apparently not on any navigational charts, but Luke instinctively knows where to go. Back to the chase, the Empire forces our heroes into a densely packed asteroid field. If I might remind you, Captain, the probability of successfully navigating such an obstacle is approximately 2,467 to 1! And the odds are even worse if it's a Tesla! Fortunately, despite Han's screw-ups and almost everything else, the man knows how to pilot a ship and manages to outmaneuver the TIE Fighters, which get blown up the farther they go in. Meanwhile, not far away, at least in a galaxy where light years are spanned simply as kilometers... Wait, does that mean in a galaxy far, far away actually just means a few kilometers away? Newly admiraled Piet goes to see Vader. Hesitant, uneasy, Piet enters the private chamber. Well, you would be hesitant and uneasy too. This place doesn't get aired out very often, and Vader's personal hygiene in his quarters can be most charitably described as mildewy. Jokes aside, the purpose of this brief scene, showing Vader's helmet being lowered onto his head, is to remind the viewers that there's actually a person under that armor. That he's not a robot or something. The breathing sound of Vader isn't something just done for dramatic effect, it's because that's legitimately someone breathing air. Piet informs Vader about the Millennium Falcon entering the asteroid field. Asteroids don't concern me, Admiral. I want that ship. 
not excuses. Pizza party in the break room if you guys get your extra work done before the end of the fiscal quarter. While Piet tries to summon his voice from a tight, dry throat, a cape is mechanically lowered and the Dark Lord stands. You know, that's something I hadn't thought of before. At some point when rebuilding Anakin, Palpatine decided, yeah, give him a cape. A cape would look so cool on him. And then had to build a device to actually attach a cape to him, because it's not like that outfit affords him a lot of dexterity to put one on himself. In the asteroid field, Han recognizes that they need to hide somewhere out of sight of the Star Destroyers, so they find a big asteroid full of caverns and enter it. Luke, meanwhile, arrives at Dagobah and, unlike the movie, almost seems to have a safer landing. Although that's relative, since he's still parked halfway inside of a bog. We end the issue with this goblin-looking dude watching over the scene, and I'm sure has no significance whatsoever. On to issue 42. And now, the Bounty Hunters, performing their touching love ballad, Don't Disintegrate My Heart. The splash page recap for this one continues the stuff with the bounty hunters as if they played a much larger role in the film than they actually did. Especially weird that they're looming over Luke in the swamp, as if he's the one they're going to be contending with. The comic cuts out the entire sequence of Luke realizing how sucky it is to be in a swamp, and R2 getting eaten and spit out by a giant fish or whatever. Good cuts to make overall, but it also kind of screws over Luke's state of mind when he's going into this. Luke is young, impatient, and annoyed by this entire situation. We joke about about Luke being whiny, but that's only because he's confronted by a lot of really irritating little things. Like, say, trying to follow some half-remembered hallucination telling him to go find a Jedi Master to continue his training, instead of going to help his friends in the Rebellion, only to find a damp, humid, muddy, dark swamp full of bugs and things trying to eat his robot. Here, he just got out of the swamp and it's like, Boy, this place is weird, huh? Plus, because of how time can be a bit wonky in Star Wars, we don't know how long it's been since he got out of the healing tube. For all we know, yesterday he's mauled and almost freezes to death. Today, a friend dies, he almost gets stepped on by a stop-motion model, and now all the swamp stuff. Although... There's something familiar about it. I'm pretty sure Uncle Owen took me here on a camping trip when I was five, and I hated it. And thus our little gremlin dude reveals himself, Luke pulling out his lightsaber instead of his blaster like in the movie. Away, put your weapon! I mean you no harm, but I am wondering, why are you here? Perhaps help you I can! For a finder's fee, of course! I... I don't think so. You see, I'm looking for a great warrior. Charles Barkley! A great warrior? Not many of those. Wars don't make one great. Being good at hockey does it. The creature takes, like, a french fry from Luke's box and tries to eat it. Looked more like a breadstick in the movie. Hey, the food concentrate stick was gonna be my dinner! This chicken is like something from out of space. Just feed it a little bit. It's cooked to fuck! The wizened little intruder seems unimpressed, particularly when he starts to chew and promptly spits out the bite taken. Phew! How you get so big eating food of this kind? Grape jelly and mustard, wrong with you the hell is! Come, come, I take you to good food. To Applebee's we go! Help you find your friend! I'm not looking for a friend, I'm looking for a Jedi Master. Oh, a Jedi Master? Different altogether. Yoda, you seek Yoda. I take you to him, come! You know him? My boyfriend he is! Absolute wampa in the sack! The order of things is changed again because the creature now grabs the little electric lamp and takes it with him as he leads Luke off. Unfortunately, the comic really just cannot convey what a little gremlin he is here. Instead, just seemingly showing him standing around instead of digging through everything, being annoying, just doesn't really work for the sake of the contrast we'll have later. Anyway, Luke tells R2 to stick around and guard the ship. Back at the asteroid field, the Star Destroyers are searching for our heroes. Two Imperial cruisers move through the asteroid field to which they have tracked the Millennium Falcon. Bombing as they go. And by bombing, they mean shooting lasers everywhere, sometimes directly into the cavern the Falcon is in. Rather than the TIE bombers we saw in the movie. Still, inside the very purple asteroid, Han and 3PO are trying to make repairs. I don't know where your ship learned to communicate, Captain, but its dialect leaves something to be desired. It keeps rambling on about droid liberation or something. 
Also, that you're not her real boyfriend? A lot of minor differences here, to the detriment of the comic versus the movie. Little character bits, for instance. 3PO points out something that needs to be replaced, Han just grumpily tells Chewie to replace it. Rather than in the film, him whispering to Chewie since he doesn't want to acknowledge 3PO was right about something. Furthermore, he checks on Leia, who's annoyed by him trying to help and finally gets him to ease off his douchiness for a second and be somewhat charming. The comic lacks instinctively rubbing Leia's hand when she might really injures it. Admittedly, in either version, he's still coming off too strong, but it's easier to believe what happens next. Leia and him start kissing because he's not yelling in her face about how she wants him. And for some reason, they don't have 3PO interrupt them to break off the kiss. Leia just kind of awkwardly moves away and the narration says, well, now she's feeling weird that she actually kind of liked that. The romance between the two feels a bit iffier in hindsight. Han just kind of continually going, yeah, you dig me and being aggressive and pissy in the early stages. It's not terrible, like I said. Moments like this, while a bit wince-inducing when she asks him to stop rubbing her hand and he doesn't, help show that he has a charming quality that could show him as someone she'd be into. I'm not saying the romance is bad, just that some moments are a bit more... In any case, Vader is soon contacted by the Emperor and he takes the call in his chamber. What is thy bidding, my master? There is a grave disturbance in the force. I can tell. You don't sound right, my master. Linkara decided to go for the original Marjorie Eaton and Clive Revel version of my voice instead of Ian McDermott. That seems like an odd choice. But it's authentic to the original time of printing, much like his decision not to use the redone colors. On that note, yeah, I don't mind the special edition replacement of the Emperor with McDermott. It is the odd one out when you look at the whole saga, really, when it comes to stuff like the special editions. I just wish they made sure to do decent re-releases of the originals, or at least as close to the originals as possible, for the sake of film preservation rather than erasing them. Anyway, the comic decides to keep the Emperor entirely in shadow for this. Just the silhouette of a guy in a robe. You must destroy him, my servant, or he will be our undoing. He's not a Jedi. Just a boy. Obi-Wan could not have taught him very much. He knows nothing of the high ground, my master. Yet with the Force so strong with him, he could be a powerful ally. If he could be turned. For a long moment, the huge holograph image flickers slightly. I mean... When does it not? I reiterate that even in expanded universe lore, at least a thousand years before the original trilogy, hologram communication technology never gets better than something with terrible V-Sync issues. Yes. Yes. He would be a great asset. Can it be done? With enough investor money. Back over to Dagobah, Luke is hanging out in the creature's house as he makes some stew. Luke is impatient and just wants to find Yoda, and the creature finally drops the act, revealing that he's Yoda. No good this. This will not do. I cannot teach him. The boy has no patience. Okay, there's patience, and then there's weird little goblin steals my food and hits my robot with a stick. This is also a case where sadly the arch doesn't really do this scene much justice. This close-up of Luke's face when Yoda says he can't teach him. In the movie, we see Yoda front and center, and how his entire demeanor changes from bumbling and silly to serious, wise, and disappointed. Instead, it's just a word balloon off to the side before a close-up of Yoda's slightly more beefy appearance here. Thing is, because of the way the art has depicted Yoda so far, he doesn't look any different here than he was before, so the fake-out doesn't quite work as well. Now, I joked a second ago about the patience thing, but in truth, the entire sequence is indeed a test for Luke. How he'll react to something like this, and he's shown to be uncaring, kind of rude, and emphasizing the wrong things. A great warrior, insulting Dagobah to one of its inhabitants, caring more about finding Yoda than anything else. A New Hope showed us the potential of Luke. Bright, eager, committed to do the right thing, and ending up the hero. But now it's time to show how these same qualities can be used negatively. Luke is human and thus imperfect, and we're finally seeing his flaws so he can actually develop. Obi-Wan's Force Ghost is hanging around and tries to encourage Yoda to train Luke. He will learn patience. We've discussed this before. Just because I'm a ghost now doesn't mean it's easy to go between planets, you know? Don't make me think my trips were wasted. Luke says he's perfectly ready to be a Jedi, leaving out where his pleading leads to him bonking his head, a nice demonstration of his impatience. Yoda breaks down Luke's problem. To become a Jedi takes the deepest commitment. All his life, this one has looked away to the horizon, to the sky, to the future. Never his mind on where he was. Hmm? 
what he was doing. Adventure. Excitement. A Jedi craves not these things. I mean, follow Jedi teachings did I, and look how good I've got it. You will learn, Yoda. We have come this far. He is our only hope. That line is really just why I'm bugged about so many Jedi escaping Order 66 in the expanded universe or in TV shows or whatever. Because clearly you have tons and tons of hopes. The only reason Luke would be special as their last hope is that somehow he's got super duper force powers like Anakin did. And I've made my feelings about the divine right of King's crap known in the other reviews. I know I'm reckless, but I've learned a lot already. I won't fail you. I'm not afraid. You will be, my young one. <laughs> you will be. But don't be, because fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. A whole thing it is. Back over to the Falcon, we skip Leia being scared of something on the windshield, just them deciding to check out some weird noises. And in fact, it's Leia who identifies the bat creature thing as a Minoc instead of Han. However, they realize that's something weird about the cave. There's too much moisture and the ground feels spongy instead of hard. Han fires a shot off into the darkness and everything starts shaking. He quickly has everyone come back in and they take off, flying out as the mouth of the cave closes. We, we were inside something. Something alive. A giant slug, probably. Usually we have one sign, the likes of which even God has never seen. Back over to Dagobah. And here's something that I'm really glad they didn't keep in the movie. Yoda is training Luke on lightsaber combat. He fails to hit a metal bar that was in the air. Can't. Not after running through miles of swamp with you on my back. Two... Tired. That bar would be in seven pieces if you were a Jedi. In the movie, Yoda never, not once, has Luke use the lightsaber. And we'll get into why in a minute, but there's something else we can talk about. What the hell's going on with Yoda in this panel? Is this just a weird perspective thing, like he's farther away in the swamp water or something? Because it looks like he's tiny and resting on Luke's shoulder with a really warped head. What follows is a montage, and once again a wonky timescale here, as Luke learns to use the lightsaber, and a teensy tiny Yoda sits on some toadstools. Luke levitates some rocks and also suspends himself up by his pinky or whatever. The implication is that Luke spends days, possibly weeks or months here, both in the movie and the comic, but that's kind of off from the Falcon side of things. Admittedly, we don't know how long they were in the asteroid, how long it takes to get to their next destination. Yeah, yeah, light speed is down, but the kinds of distances we're talking about here should mean they die of old age before reaching it otherwise under realistic measures. Or how long they stay there, but it feels like months is a stretch. Anyway, Luke discovers his X-Wing is sunk into the swamp. He tries and fails to get it out of the water. It's worse than we left it! This is a lot different than moving stones. I'm trying, but I can't! I it's too big! Try not! Do, do, or do not. There is no try. Attempting things isn't real! Size has no meaning. Look at me. Judge me by my size? No. Leapfrog around you with a lightsaber I can, whippersnapper! And here's the kicker. And well, you shouldn't. For my ally is the Force. And powerful it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. It surrounds and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not just crude flesh. Feel it, you must. Feel the force flow. Feel the force around you, everywhere, waiting to be used. Between you and me. Between the trees and the rocks. Yes, even between this land and that ship. But screw all that! Cutting an inanimate carbon rod into seven pieces is what really matters to be a Jedi! Yeah, that's why seeing Yoda train Luke with a lightsaber is so dumb. Because the actual important part is mastery of the Force. Understanding its complexities, letting it flow into you, learning of how to control it and how it controls you. Because the Force is something more and it's not intended for violence or destruction or combat. You can certainly use it for those things, but a Jedi is supposed to be about peace, serenity, calm. Hell, I noticed the comic left out Yoda's lines about a Jedi using the Force for knowledge and defense. Defense. Never attack. Anytime a piece of media puts a lot of emphasis on a lightsaber being so important, I wince. A lightsaber is a tool, a way that can express your mastery in the Force, but that kind of combat training wouldn't be in Yoda's teachings because it's not about waving around a stick. It's about more than the physical. 
So yeah, as demonstration of that, Yoda lifts the X-Wing out of the swamp, to Luke's amazement. It is not given the grandeur the moment has in the film, though I somewhat get it because of condensing the narrative. Hell, he's still making the speech about luminous beings while lifting the thing here. And again, why the hell is Yoda, like, the size of a pixie? Sure, size matters not, but we already established how big he was, and the movie was out by now! Why is he smaller than Luke's head? Anyway, 12 pages in, and now... the bounty hunters. Vader has recruited a bunch of them to hunt down the Millennium Falcon. There will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. You and your band are highly regarded in your particular trade, Boba Fett. Do not disappoint me. Given a free hand, I've never disappointed anyone. You say that, but I've seen your Disney Plus series. It was fine. Mandalorian Season 2.5. You are free to use any method necessary, but I want proof. No disintegrations. You know, much like the shapeshifter revelation from the prequels, I do have to kind of tilt my head at that line the more I think about it. Have we ever seen a handheld weapon in the movies or TV shows that would vaporize someone? I don't know, there are a few shows I haven't seen yet, but still. In any case, I also love that this version of the dialogue implies that these guys all work for Boba Fett and are not just several different bounty hunters being briefed. Also, hey Bosk, why is your spacesuit blue here? However, this little party is interrupted when he's informed that they found the Falcon again. Regardless of how long it's been, the hyperdrive is still broken and they've cleared the asteroid field, so there's nowhere to run. As such, Han figures out a plan, running right at the Star Destroyer, pursuing them and they seem to vanish from their sensors. We quickly see what happened. Han landed the Falcon directly on the Star Destroyer's hull. Some dude is bringing his date to the most scenic window on the ship and wondering why the hell it's all covered up. We check in on Luke and Yoda, who is indeed still training Luke with the lightsaber, though here we're using it better, to illustrate the point Yoda had made in the movie with running and jumping. Although the order of these scenes has been twisted around, this was supposed to be before using the Force to raise the X-Wing. Luke is skilled enough to cut the rod into four pieces now, but he's disappointed in himself. But it's taking so long! A Jedi could do seven! Let me try again. This time I'm angry enough to- No! No! Anger. Fear. Aggression. The dark side of the Force are they. Easily do they flow. A Force laxative it is. Quick to join you in a fight. Beware. A heavy price is paid for the power they bring. Your wardrobe into all black clothes it becomes. Easier, quicker, more seductive is the dark side. But once you start down that path, forever will it dominate. Consume you it will as it did Obi-Wan's apprentice. Seen here, a man consumed by the dark side. You're so beautiful. My boat. Back to Vader. Lord Vader, our complete scan has found nothing. The Millennium Falcon must have gone into light speed. It's no doubt on the other side of the galaxy now, as opposed to where we are, the polka dotted side of the galaxy. As the Star Destroyers prepare to leave, Han tells the others his plan. It's standard Imperial procedure to dump their garbage before going into light speed. Littering. Truly the Empire's greatest sin. So they'll power down, disconnect, and pretend to be garbage floating away. Ah, oh, that old pizza box is shaped like the Millennium Falcon. And it's as big as a freighter. Man, Vader was hungry today. And thus they make their escape, Leia complimenting him on the plan. Now that they're free, they need to go someplace safe to make repairs. Han checks his records and sees that the Bespin system is nearby, with a place run by an old friend of his, Lando Calrissian. Can you trust him, Han? Sure, last time I saw him, he became Childish Gambino. As the Falcon heads out to Bespin, what they don't see is that another piece of space garbage is actually Boba Fett's ship Slave One, which pursues him and ends the issue. On the planet Dagobah, Luke Skywalker is in training to become a Jedi under the centuries-old master, Yoda. Pictured here? None of that. Like, even the next paragraph brings up Boba Fett pursuing the Millennium Falcon, and neither party is on the page either. It's Cloud City on Bespin, along with Lando and his people. Still though, next page we get the Falcon arriving there, and getting warning shots fired at them from the locals. They're instructed to land at a specific platform, where Lando is waiting for them. Han Solo, you slimy double-crossing no-good swindler. I can explain everything, buddy. I know I photoshopped you out of the swimsuit calendar, but that's only because the higher-ups very wrongly assumed you weren't photogenic enough. 
Suddenly, Lando can hold his scowl no longer. Laughter fills the morning air, and blasters are swiftly lowered. But we're not going to show any of that. Here's a heavily in shadows Lando with a blank expression on his face. They explain how the Falcon needs repairs, and we learn that the ship used to belong to Lando. Which, hilariously, if you've seen Solo, you know that Han managed to turn the gorgeous interiors of the ship into a cruddy mess over the years, since I guess he refuses to dust or anything. While Lando reassures them that he'll get his best people on it, 3PO, for no reason in the comic, wanders off on his own. Lando is now responsible for the entire outpost, no longer a smuggler and schemer like Han was, but let's forget about that for a second. 3PO thinks he overhears an R2 unit and goes to investigate, but when he enters a room that it came from, whatever's on the other side, well... The sentence is cut short by the ugly whine of laser bolts. As this comic goes on, it just becomes more and more terrified of showing things happening and is letting the narration carry it. Back on Dagobah, Yoda's grown to slightly better proportions and we get the tree scene. Something's not right, Yoda. I feel danger. Death. Cold. It's like having a conversation with David Zaslav. This tree is strong with the dark side of the Force. A servant of evil it is. Into it you must go. How does a tree become strong with the dark side? Is there a bunch of kudzu on it or something? Is it actually an ent who got corrupted? Is it the monster from the movie From Hell It Came? What's in there, Master? Only what you take with you. So you're saying if there's a hundred bucks in my wallet, there'll be another hundred bucks waiting in there! Your weapon. You won't need it. A lunchbox you may need, though. It's a long trip. He steps into the cave with the lightsaber anyway and is confronted by Darth Vader. Oh no, Luke had a Darth Vader action figure in his pocket! He's also not wearing a shirt for some reason, but he fights the image of Darth Vader and strikes it down. The black helmet mask separates from the body, falling with a dreamlike motion to shatter upon the cavern floor, and reveal the greatest nightmare of all. That's right, Mr. Computer. No, no! That's my face! Yeah, thanks for the exposition, Luke. Would have been real nice if we could see that and not have you announce it, but, you know, we needed the splash page recap. And then a splash page of the Falcon approaching Cloud City. And each of these books only has about 17 pages, less than most regular comics. Why is this episode so long when it feels like sometimes there isn't much content? In the movie, there was a brief surreal fight, because I guess Luke only brought half the frames in with him. But it conveyed that weird dreamlike quality before he cut off Vader's head and was confronted with his own face behind the mask. His fear of falling to the dark side like Obi-Wan's apprentice and potential foreshadowing for the big twist. Back over to Cloud City, Leia's wondering what the hell happened to 3PO and again we're uncertain of the time scale of things. It doesn't seem like they've been here longer than a day or two, but who knows how long they actually are. Chewie interrupts Han and Leia kissing again with 3PO in pieces, having found him in a junk pile about to be recycled. Him actually finding 3PO's body was cut for this adaptation, and definitely a good cut for the comic. Not that the scene was bad, just that it's unnecessary. Han thinks that if Chewie can't repair him, they should hand him over to Lando, but Leia has been growing distrustful of him over... Well, nothing. Speaking of, Lando comes in and offers them the chance to join him for some refreshments. Ah, I see you found the droid we were gonna recycle into the silverware for said refreshments. On Dagobah, Luke's meditations into the Force cause him to have a vision of the future, of his friends suffering at Cloud City. Luke wants to go help them, but Yoda cautions him against it. If you leave now, help them you could, but you would destroy all for which they have fought and suffered. And come with you to help and train you on the way, I cannot, because... Uh, waiting for something from Space Amazon could take weeks. The comic version of Cloud City has them walking around outside more with the standard Star Wars walkways without safety railings, and they talk about how cool the place is. Han wonders if the Empire will learn about their mining operations, but Lando says he just cut a deal that'll keep the Empire out forever. And he opens the door to the dining hall to reveal Darth Vader and Boba Fett, Lando saying that they arrived just before Han did. Han quickly pulls his gun and fires, and Vader demonstrates his own skill by just holding out his hand and deflecting the shots effortlessly. Boba Fett and I would be honored if you would join us. Boba Fett cooked chicken wings with his signature barbecue sauce. Luke can't stand the visions of his friends suffering any longer and prepares to leave. Obi-Wan's Force Ghost appears entirely and discourages him. You're not ready, Luke. You feel the Force, but cannot control it. You are now most susceptible to the temptations of the dark side. Temptations like cool capes and torturing your friends. 
Uh, okay, admittedly, it's more an emotional and psychological thing, but still. Only a fully trained Jedi Knight will conquer Vader and his Emperor. Well, gee, mister, more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Why don't you and the Pixie Frog come along to help then? Choose the quick and easy path and you'll become an agent of evil, plunging the galaxy into the abyss of hate and despair. What about any of this is the quick and easy path? You are the last Jedi. Be patient. Come episode 8, Luke remembers those words while confronting Kylo Ren and is like, sure, Obi-Wan. Luke can't sacrifice Han and Leia and promises to heed their words, but also to return and finish his training later. As the X-Wing departs, he's still reckless, Yoda. Things are going to get worse, I fear. But the boy is our last hope. No, Obi-Wan. There is another. So George Lucas originally planned at this point to not only have a prequel trilogy, but a sequel trilogy that would focus on Luke's long lost twin sister, who would eventually be the one to take down the Emperor in said sequel trilogy. Vader would be the ultimate villain of this trilogy. But what gets me is that he chose to make Leia Luke's sister when he abandoned his plans to do more movies after Return of the Jedi in order to fulfill the there is another plans. But nothing about this dialogue indicates that it's supposed to be a sister. Why couldn't Leia just be really strong in the Force and thus another hope? It's one of the things that bothers me so much about the divine right of King's crap and all the backlash against Rey doing Jedi stuff in Force Awakens. It's like people forget that Force-sensitive people are being born all the time. They didn't just stop happening when the Jedi were wiped out, it just meant no one was recruiting them anymore. People with the same powers and potential for good or evil, as long as someone told them, Hey, did you know you could do this? But whatever, at Cloud City, Han is being tortured by Vader, knowing that his pain will be a beacon to Luke to bring him there. He tells Boba Fett that he'll get Solo when Luke arrives, and further tells Lando that Leia and Chewbacca have to stay in the city for the rest of their lives. Lando objects, saying that this was never part of their deal. I hope you don't think you're being treated unfairly, Calrissian. It would be most unfortunate if I had to leave a permanent garrison at your outpost. And you won't have Boba Fett around to cook for them. In his cell, Chewbacca is allowed to repair 3PO, who regains consciousness, though his head is on backwards. Is there no end to a droid's suffering? Blasted to pieces for accidentally bumping into some stormtroopers? You know, that's something I hadn't thought of before. If it was just some stormtroopers who did this, what was making the R2 unit noises that led him there in the first place? Han is shoved into the cell afterwards, and Lando explains what's going on. That he didn't know about the bounty on Han or anything, but is trying to make this easier on them. He also explains that this was all just a way to get Luke to them. Han punches him for all this, and Lando lets him get away with that. I've done as much as I can. I wish it were more. But I've got my own problems. I've already stuck my neck out further than I should. Yeah, yeah, Lando. You're a real hero. I gotta say, this is the worst episode of the Calrissian Chronicles. Vader, meanwhile, decides the best way to contain Luke once he arrives is to free him in a substance called Carbamite. Lando is reluctant about the plan, saying that it might kill him. As such, Vader plans to test it on Han Solo. As Luke's X-Wing arrives, Han is readied and Leia finally admits that she loves him. Just remember that, Leia, because I'll be back. Admittedly, I'll probably be Mr. Freeze next time you see me, but still. In the movie, it's the oft-remembered, I know, in response, which a friend of mine did find a little iffy in hindsight, that that's not really reassuring to the woman you love, but I think it's more about him acknowledging her admittance. She already knows he's into her, but after all this time, as she's expressed her frustration with him and all, it's about reassuring him that she does indeed love him, and he's telling her, I know, don't worry, you don't have to be worried about me not knowing. And so Han is turned into a human popsicle to end out the issue, leading to the final part. Vader is informed of Luke's arrival and he orders a permanent garrison be set up in Cloud City to make sure Leia and Chewie never leave. In the movie, he actually decided to take them with him, which makes more sense, Leia's a bigwig in the Rebellion, there's no reason why she wouldn't be taken for interrogation. That wasn't our bargain! You said the Empire wouldn't interfere in- I am altering the bargain. Pray I don't alter it any further. Unfortunately for Vader, Lando soon brought him to space court with the best lawyer in the galaxy. Whom Vader then force choked. In the comic, he even briefly force chokes Lando. Jeez. Luke spots them carrying Han away, but Boba Fett shoots at him before he can do anything to stop them. He even spots the others being escorted away, but Leia just screams at him that it's a trap before a blast door cuts him off from them and R2. Luke is led into the carbon freezing chamber to confront Vader. The Force is with you, young Skywalker. But you're not a Jedi yet. For that, you have to complete this certification exam. 
And there's a fee to take it. And thus, while Luke and Vader begin their fight, Lando switches sides, getting his security forces to hold the stormtroopers and free our heroes. Chewbacca takes this all well. <laughs> However, he finally gets them to see reason when he points out they can still free Han from Boba Fett. R2 meets up with them as they reach the landing platform, but they're too late. Boba Fett taking flight as more stormtroopers arrive. They head off to reach the Millennium Falcon while Luke and Vader fight, and the colorist made a choice, certainly. Instead of the dark, smoky industrial area of the movie, it's very bright while Luke and Vader remain in shadows and almost silhouettes. It kinda works to further Vader's imposing figure, but honestly it just feels like they were running out of time to finish and figured a big black void would be easier to have. There's something to be said for making him out as this kind of dark, corrupting, inky force, but it really feels just kind of awkward, especially when I know what it's supposed to look like. Luke is knocked into the carbon freezing chamber, but he leaps out before he can be frozen. Not that you see it, of course, because instead he has to announce in the next panel that he leapt up really far. Look, I get it. Movie adaptations can be hard and you're on a rush deadline, but it feels like some motion lines here would have done the job and not been as awkward. Obi-Wan has taught you well. You've controlled your fear. Now release your anger. I destroyed your family. Take your revenge! Yes, my brilliant plan is that he will kill me and then join my side! It, wait. Because we need to rush things along, Luke is suddenly in a completely different hallway for the continuation of the fight. Space is warped and time is bendable. Luke, worried about giving in to his darker impulses, hesitates as Vader eggs him on and starts tossing random bits of machinery at him with the Force. Eventually, he's shoved through a window and is on a narrow platform to continue the fight. Why resist further? You are beaten, Luke. Don't let yourself be destroyed as Obi-Wan did. You'll be called a ripoff, Luke. Let yourself be destroyed in an original way. Our heroes continue their chase to the Falcon, continually finding themselves intercepted by stormtroopers, who I definitely think earned the reputation of being bad shots here. Sure, you can say in A New Hope they wanted the Falcon to escape, but here, no, their aim sucks. And once again, Lando announces he did something off-panel that we saw in the movie to get things along, telling the citizens of Cloud City to evacuate as the Empire is taking over. Which sadly spares us the iconic scene of this dude running away with an ice cream maker. I don't know why that fact perplexes people so much. Reusing random bits of junk as props is a time-honored tradition. It's especially before 3D printers were more common. I can show you behind the scenes of Star Trek stuff and how much props they made out of everyday objects of the time. And thus we reach one of the most egregious examples of the comic leaving out something and only explaining it in narration. Back at the reactor core, above the shaft's howling winds, the steady clash of sabers can be heard until the Dark Lord's blade comes slicing through part of the gantry equipment to strike Luke's sword arm. Pain seizes the young warrior. His weapon falls. The hand that grasped it will never grasp anything again. Yeah, they cut off Luke's hand in narration captions. All you see is Luke's lightsaber hanging in the air. Why is this comic so bad at showing important moments or scenes up close and in the moment? Luke retreats farther down the catwalk over the big pit. There is no escape, Luke. Don't make me slay you. Join me. Together we will be more powerful than the Emperor. It was meant to be. Take my hand, Luke. I... Oh, right. There are many things Obi-Wan kept from you, such as what happened to your father. Ben told me enough! He told me you killed my father! No, Luke. I am your father. This is a weird remake of How I Met Your Mother. I really do wonder what sort of world, what sort of different story this would have been had we gotten the twist that was here as a placeholder to keep the real twist from getting leaked. That Obi-Wan killed his father. Would Vader have turned back to good? Would we learn that Luke's father was actually becoming as bad as Vader and that's why Obi-Wan killed him? Some kind of misinterpretation of events so that Vader thought Obi-Wan killed him when he didn't? Who knows? What we do know is that Luke senses the truth. Luke, you can destroy the Emperor. He has foreseen this. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't have any clones or anything on standby in case that happens. We can rule the galaxy together, father and son. Yeah, starting a business with your family seems like a good idea sometimes, but I think that's just gonna do more harm than good to your relationship. 
With no other choice, Luke leaps down into the pit in the comic, screaming, NEVER! as he goes, which is just kind of goofy, honestly, and yet feels like the kind of thing George Lucas would have inserted into a new edition. Vader stares as the youth vanishes into the darkness. That's it! You are grounded, young man! As the narration points out, this isn't a bottomless pit, but an air tunnel and ventilation system. So Luke gets sucked into a vent and shoved out of the city to hang precariously from a weather vane. As our heroes reach the Millennium Falcon and take off, Vader orders his ship come in to retrieve both Luke and the Falcon. With the Force, Luke reaches out to Leia, who orders them to turn around and retrieve him. Oh, thank goodness, the Falcon turning around gets a splash page. Very important moment to be depicted and shown on an entire page here, rather than the I am your father reveal, or Luke arm getting cut off. Lando catches Luke as he falls off the weather vane, though in the comic it apparently snaps from the weight rather than Luke falling unconscious. They reach orbit and try to leave, but the hyperdrive still isn't working, much to Lando's surprise since he ordered his crews to fix it. It was then that Lando discovered that he was actually a terrible boss and everybody in Cloud City hated his guts. Luke, delirious, asks Obi-Wan why he didn't tell him about Vader being his father, but no time for that. R2 already found out the Empire disabled their hyperdrive when their capture was ordered, so goes off to reactivate it instead of finishing repairs on 3PO. The Millennium Falcon speeds off to safety at last while Vader just walks off. Sometime later, in a safe sector of space, a patient recuperates from an operation that has given him a new hand. One that is mechanized, cybernetically controlled. And one we will not show you because instead this panel features 3PO saying, Hey, Lando's calling. Lando says that he and Chewie are off to try to rescue Han from Jabba the Hutt on Tatooine. And so our comic and the movie ends with the rest of our heroes watching the Falcon fly away in hope that this trilogy can have a happy ending. Well, I can definitively say that the Empire did in fact strike back, fulfilling the one thing it needed to accomplish. Unfortunately, this comic kinda sucks. It's not entirely without merit, it is still The Empire Strikes Back after all, but while you can forgive some adaptation choices of condensing stuff or leaving in lines that would eventually be cut into the finished movie, you really have to wonder why the artists, Al Williamson and Carlos Garzon, kept failing to include really visual, important moments of the movie and instead just pulling back and letting the narration do the heavy lifting. Sure, even as a movie adaptation, this was probably made using the Marvel method, where the writer would just include so much narration, almost distracting trustful of the artists to get the point across, but I have to imagine they knew how significant some of these shots are, but instead letting dialogue and narration captions tell us what's going on instead of showing us. I will grant it that it manages to condense the movie into six issues of less than average length, and it doesn't feel like it's too overstuffed, but for a movie that had great cinematography, the art failed to convey how good the movie looked. I started this review with the question, what makes The Empire Strikes Back the best Star Wars movie? And I think it's a lot of things. Competent heroes, competent villains, tense situations, the war of the title, the big moments being treated like big moments, and the terrible tragic events treated as the terrible tragic events they are. We see the triumphs of the villains and want our heroes to rise up that much more but can't just yet. And I think that's one of the big factors of its success. The thing I keep speaking about when it comes to why I love superhero comics. It leaves us wanting more. It leaves us wanting the next chapter, to see our heroes finally get that victory they so rightly deserve. Having a dark story is one thing, but it's not about wallowing in misery, it's about getting back up and resolving the darkness in some way that leaves the audience satisfied. It does what it promised it would do push our heroes to their breaking point as the Empire proves how strong they are even without a Death Star. And yet our heroes make it through. They haven't won through yet, but we know they will. And it gets us to think about the Force in new ways too, as a way of bringing these people together, just as all things are joined by it. The Dark Side came out on top today, but not tomorrow. Next time, back to Patreon-sponsored reviews as we check out another epic multi-part story with the first segment of Mega Man and Sonic... Worlds Collide!
Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!